The very first thing that I said when I reviewed Spider-Man 2 was, could Homecoming be better than Spider-Man 2? Without flinching, just getting this out of the way right now, yes it is. Spider-Man Homecoming is the second reboot in terms of Spider-Man movies, the first one to take place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and the 16th MCU movie overall. Holy crap. I know I said the exact same thing when I reviewed Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 earlier this summer, but I still can't believe that the series is 16 movies in and not even 10 years old. That's impressive. But anywho, Spider-Man Homecoming basically follows Peter Parker in his high school life as Spider-Man. He got introduced in Captain America Civil War, where he took part in that giant airport battle. And this movie takes place about two months after the events of that movie, where he's basically going around Queens, being your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, while also trying to juggle his high school life and his relationship with his friends, his aunt, just personal life altogether. Things don't get any easier though with the appearance of Adrian Tums, aka the Vulture, who starts to steal a bunch of important alien technology that the Chitauri left over from the Battle of New York in the Avengers, and it's up to Spider-Man to try to stop him and figure out why he's doing all this. Spider-Man has always had a very interesting history when it comes to media. He's been in several shows for decades, uh, different incarnations all around, uh, but when it comes to movies, the main one that most people remember are the first three Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. I absolutely love the first Spider-Man movie from 2002, and while I think Spider-Man 2 is a more well-made movie than Spider-Man 1, I personally don't like it as much as Spider-Man 1. I think Dr. Octavius is not a good villain when you compare him to the Green Goblin. Spider-Man 3 was disappointing, but it had a lot of really great moments to it as well, and then the, the Amazing Spider-Man movies were just an embarrassment. Just all-around embarrassment. The second one was so bad that it killed that entire series, uh, and that led Sony to make a deal with Marvel to bring Spider-Man into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where, as I mentioned before, we got his introduction in Captain America Civil War, and now we have his first solo movie, and as I said in my intro for the video, it's the best damn Spider-Man movie we have. I am not flinching at all when I say that. I'm saying that with a straight face. This is a near-perfect Spider-Man movie for me. For one, it gets the character right. I mean, the character's been done right several times beforehand, but this is a Spider-Man that I've always wanted to see. When I reviewed Civil War, I said that Tom Holland is the best Spider-Man that we have. He combines Peter Parker and Spider-Man in the costume perfectly, and that statement still stands. Tom Holland is everything I imagine when I think of the character of Peter Parker. He's young, he's enthusiastic. They do cut out the obvious tragedy that led him to be Spider-Man, but you know what? We've seen that done over and over again, not just in the movies, but in several cartoons. And I'm glad they don't focus on Uncle Ben at all. They don't mention him by name. They don't see him get shot again. This movie pretty much follows the formula that Batman the Animated Series did, where rather than giving you all the backstory on how Peter Parker became Spider-Man, they just dump you right in the middle of the story. And I really appreciate that because after five movies beforehand where it had to focus on the tragedy, it is nice to see Spider-Man in the middle of his story here. Even if within the universe, he's only been Spider-Man for six months. Now let's talk about the high school element because when we look at the first Spider-Man by Sam Raimi, he was in high school. It was a backdrop. He graduated before the halfway point of the movie, and that was it. And then in Amazing Spider-Man, once again, high school was just a complete backdrop and not significant to the story at all. High school in this movie is significant to Peter Parker and the story overall because that was what this movie was aiming to do. One thing that I love about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that each movie they make is a subgenre. It is a superhero movie, sure, but it's also something else. The Thor movies and Doctor Strange are fantasy movies, Ant-Man is a heist film, the Guardians of the Galaxy films are space operas, uh, the Avengers films are science fiction, uh, 
and to an extent the Iron Man movies also. The Incredible Hulk was a monster movie, Captain America the First Avenger is a war movie, Winter Soldier was a spy movie, and Civil War was a political drama. So they have a lot of variety when making these movies. Spider-Man Homecoming is a high school movie that's also a superhero movie, which is something that we've never really seen before. It's important that they focus on the high school element because it makes it stand out from the other Spider-Man movies. And what I also love is that it's an authentic looking high school in Queens where you get all kinds of kids with different ethnicities and different backgrounds. And all these actors look like they belong in high school. Even though Tom Holland is in his early 20s, uh, he looks like he's 16 years old, or 15 since he says that's his actual age in the movie. And there's no high school student throughout this whole movie that looks like they're in their mid to late 20s. Uh, I'm looking at you, Jumanji 2. And it just makes it feel more authentic. Uh, and I love all the relationships between all the high school students. They're very believable. Uh, the relationship Peter Parker has with his best friends believable. The way Peter interacts with this love interest is great. There's this other character who's this weird artsy kind of girl. Like, it's it's better to just watch the movie because she's one of the standouts uh, for the little time she's in it. And Flash Thompson feels more like a believable bully. The one mission statement that the director wanted to try to accomplish with this movie was try to give it a John Hughes feel. Sort of like with Breakfast Club or Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And while this movie is nowhere near as good as those two, it definitely succeeds as a high school movie and truly makes it stand out from the past Spider-Man movies and even other superhero movies out there. I just love it. And speaking of variety, thank God that this Spider-Man movie takes place in many different locations and not just New York City. And we get to see Spider-Man interact with the environment in ways that we've never seen in the past few movies. It's really well done. And the montage they have where he's stopping crime and just being a good citizen all around, like giving an old lady directions, is really fun. It's really cute and charming. And the movie also puts Spider-Man in different places altogether, like he's in a suburban neighborhood where he has to to figure out how to web swing from tree to tree when the trees aren't really that high up and the movie also places him in Washington DC where he tries to get a better understanding of how his powers work it really adds a lot of variety that when you lump all these Spider-Man movies together, Homecoming is the only one that you could easily tell apart from the others. I mean, unless you looked at all the actors, uh, the Amazing Spider-Man movies look too much like the Sam Raimi movies. Now, I know one thing that a lot of people were worried on is if Iron Man was going to take over half of the movie because they show Tony Stark in most of the advertising. That horrible poster seems to emphasize on Iron Man more than Spider-Man. And in a lot of the other posters, Iron Man's just kind of put in the background in a very lazy kind of way. I'm happy to say that that's not the case with the actual movie. That was all just bad marketing because Tony Stark does play an important role in the movie, but he's also not in it that much. He's in it enough to leave an impact, but not enough to take over from Spider-Man's role because it's still Spider-Man's movie. It mainly focuses on him, and whenever they have to bring in Tony Stark, he's used in the right ways and at the appropriate times to where it's important to the story. I think the Vulture stands out as one of the best villains that Marvel has to offer. Michael Keaton's performance is great, and his charisma is definitely something that amp up this role, you understand why Adrian is doing the things that he's doing throughout this movie. And there's a twist in the movie that not only justifies his actions, but it also leads into a very intense scene with him and Peter Parker that will leave you on the edge of your seat. I know a lot of people out there were saying, uh, there wasn't that much emotional attachment to this movie, or I just didn't feel anything. I'd be goddamned if somebody would watch that scene and not feel tense throughout it because it definitely made me feel nervous. And also, I love the look of the Vulture. Obviously, when they make these comic book movies, uh, the designs for the characters are not going to be 100% accurate because what works in comics doesn't necessarily work in live action. And with the Vulture, I think it's a really cool design. And one of the things that makes Spider-Man 2 a lesser movie than this one is because a lot of Dr. Octopus's actions are just kind of stupid and you question why he's doing the thing 
things he's doing. Uh, with the vulture, you don't question anything he's doing. You understand why he's doing the things that he's doing. And I think Michael Keaton just has more charisma. He's not really meant to be a likable character. And that's the way it should be viewed as. A lot of Spider-Man's villains are never likable to begin with. Also, the movie is really funny. It's probably one of Marvel's funniest movies out there. Marvel always does a great job with the comedy in their movies. And there are a lot of moments in this movie that made me laugh. There are a lot of visual gags, just a lot of jokes, uh, and just character scenarios that made me laugh hard. And again, like all the best movies, it's never forced. It feels authentic and it's all character-based humor, which is the best kind of humor for me when it comes from the characters and not from some over-the-top slapstick. And that especially leads into the best end credit scene that they have that doesn't tease to another movie. I won't say what the scene is, but I have to say that you will regret if you leave before that scene because it is worth the time. And it's definitely better than the five post credit scenes in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 because this one will actually make you laugh hard. I personally think this is a near-perfect movie. It's my favorite Spider-Man movie, but if I had some problems, I would say that the final battle is not very well filmed. Sure, it's all CG, but the... But the rest of the action in the movie is very well done, and seeing Spider-Man utilize his suit is very creative. But the last action scene is just a little... Sh but the last action scene can be shot a little too close up, and there are times where you really can't make out what's going on. It's not as bad as the action scenes in Batman Begins, but it's just kind of disappointing considering all the action scenes beforehand were really well done. And the last thing I had is more of a disappointment based on expectations. So Michael Giacchino composed a really great orchestral version of the classic Spider-Man theme from the 60s. And it's a really great theme. And once it starts playing in the movie uh, during the Marvel logo, I got chills because it's an iconic theme. And I always thought, what theme song are they going to make for Spider-Man this time around? And when we all saw that video of Michael Giacchino creating the theme and composing the orchestra, I just thought, you know what? That's perfect. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And an orchestral version of the 60s theme is absolutely phenomenal. It's perfect. Too bad it doesn't play into the rest of the movie. That theme plays during the Marvel logo, and that's it. You don't hear that theme anywhere else. And again, that had to do with expectations. I think a lot of people will be disappointed and probably see eye to eye with me. But if you don't, that's totally fine. There's not much else to say about this movie. I think this is a damn near perfect Spider-Man movie for me. It's one of my favorite in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But since I like a majority of the movies, I would say this is probably middle of the road. Which is still very, very, very good. The characters are great. The action scenes are fun. I love how it's a high school movie and not just a superhero movie. I love Tom Holland as Spider-Man. I love the dynamic between all the characters. I like the villain. The comedy works really well. It's just really well done all around. So given that this is my favorite Spider-Man movie, I will say get off your ass and go see it right now. It's really starting to become a great summer overall. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was good, but it didn't really start the summer with a bang. And then we got Alien Covenant, which started off great and then was ruined by the ending. And then Pirates of the Caribbean, which was just more of the same shit and not improved at all. And then Wonder Woman came in to save the day and kick some ass, uh, which I also love. Uh, but then The Mummy, Cars 3, and Despicable Me 3 came in and was just like, well, god damn it, this summer's going down the crapper once again. And no, I still haven't seen Transformers, that's why I didn't mention it. But then Baby Driver, War for the Planet of the Apes, and now Spider-Man Homecoming came back to save the summer. We still have a few more weeks to go, but right now things are going to get on the right track. Now, really briefly, how does Spider-Man Homecoming compare to the other superhero movies that have come out? Huh? Well... I really love this movie, but I think I like Logan and Wonder Woman a little better. It's not really fair to compare because uh, thematically, they're all very different movies, but Logan and Wonder Woman just had more of an emotional impact for me. Still love Spider-Man Homecoming, but I don't know if it's going to stick around for one of my 10 favorite movies of the year the way Logan and Wonder Woman will definitely stick around. But we'll see. We'll see what the future holds. And that's my review for Spider-Man Homecoming. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are 
are in the movie, if and when you've seen it. I don't know if I'll be doing a spoiler review for Spider-Man Homecoming. I don't think I will, but if you want to hear me talk spoilers, I'll definitely be doing that in my Let's Plays for Ultimate Spider-Man. So those videos upload every Tuesday. Go check them out. And as always, this is the real Mr. Robinson telling you there is only one.